Welcome back to another week at Drone DJ. And as you can probably hear, I almost got my voice back. I mean, it still sounds like I've been smoking for that case. Um, but <laughs> <you> anyway. <laughs> if you hear me, now I'm the one who's uh, not feeling well because I got COVID. So <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So Kirk is kind of trying to balance me. Um, okay, so news this week. We've got a update from Microsoft uh, Drone Simulator. I kind of like the original simulator too, but they also launched a project AirSim, which we will talk about in just a minute. We also have update from Drone Deploy. Um, it was supporting the Air 2 before, and now they just added the Air 2S support. Then we also have an interesting project from UK, which is approving a 165-mile drone superhighway. We'll talk about that in a second. And lastly, the DJI conference every year uh, finally came back for the in-person uh, model this year, and it's back in Vegas in October. That's mostly with a enterprise focus. So let's go back to the start of our story, kick off with the Microsoft Simulator. And let me just share the story with everyone. Uh, Kirk, did you have a chance to try the original simulator? I did not. I, uh, I've i only just now, um, you know, kind of checked out this one. I haven't been able to actually physically check this one out, of course. But yeah, no, I never got to try the original one. This one looks really good, though. I guess depending on the system, like the computer yeah. system you're right. If you have, of really course. Well, yeah, everything's based off that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we tried uh, the original simulator. I mean, I liked it quite a bit. I like the ability to, you know, not crash my drone in reality, but doing it <laughs> in the simulator it definitely breaks yeah. the lights of the bank. But I did like the the control seemed uh, really, you know, organic. Like it felt very close to what a drone control, you know, really is. Um, and also DJI has their simulator too that mm -hmm. you could do from the controller, right? So it's really your preference. I mean, I've also played the, talking about options, um, I've played the VR with the simulator too. So it really comes down to your computer system capabilities and just your personal preference, you know, yeah. which one you prefer. Now, I, this one's definitely uh, mostly more based around for the commercial side of things because it's uh, the idea of it is basically instead of trying to, hash out your ideas and, and verify your systems in the real world where you have to get a lot, get through a lot of red tape um, and a lot of challenges to just to kind of do the same things that like, you know, we've seen from other um, air taxi uh, companies are doing either in Europe or here in the United States. You can do this in a simulator and pretty much get to as close as you can get, at least get a lot of things kind of off and a lot of the, the, uh, the early hurdles done before you go in the real world testing, which is pretty smart. I mean, it, it, a lot of the stuff, especially in the United States, is not being as friendly as other countries. Um, this was definitely a way to, for U.S. companies, at least, to, to jumpstart their development. It's good to test the proof of concept, for sure. Um, personally, I still prefer, like, I'm a little more experiential. Uh, uh -huh. I would rather take a mini two or mini three and just go try smashing it up. Oh, of course. Different things and and see what happens. But again, that's just me, right? I mean, there's two ways of doing of doing everything. And coming from the space industry, we've we've actually been able to see this and like happen in real time, where uh, SpaceX is down in Texas, like blowing up rockets. Like a few years ago, they're just blowing them up left and right, uh, trying to build this rocket. Versus uh, NASA's approach, where everything was done on paper and simulations, and then they double checked everything and quadruple checked everything yeah uh and then that now they have a rocket that's going to be launching in a few months that they're both going to be certified to fly just in two different ways different approaches for sure yeah. um like i said i'm just a little more experiential and i just uh -huh. find um you know the whole point of drone industry is the entry-level barrier is much lower than your traditional aviation like oh, yeah. you don't see people to say hey i want to try a new 777 <laughs> let's just take it for a spin and see what happens um but you can do that with drones now you can spend mm. you know a thousand dollars if um you know buying a mini three take it up in the air and see if you like it or not but i find obviously if you want to go with more of a professional or commercial testing um, there's definitely a lot more involved. Yeah, this would be interesting to see though. Like, if you're trying to, if you want to try to practice operating a, dr a swarm of dr uh, of drones, you know, and not having to like actually get a swarm of drones and like actually fly it, you can just throw this in a simulation and be like, oh, I guess I, I guess it does kind of work. It's not as hard as I thought it was going to be. Like, 
um, stuff like that. That might be pretty awesome. Yeah, but individual drones. Yeah, just just buy one and fly it out there. Just don't run into a tree like I did in my first 30 minutes. Just <laughs> there you go. Um, so if anyone is you know planning to try it or has tried it, have any, have any user feedback, please let us know. Now, next, we have a drone deploy update, that which is now supporting the Air 2S. Um, I guess you also have to look past the headlines, right, to see <laughs> what the details are. I remember when drone deploy started uh, supporting the Air 2, um, it was not the fully uh, automated mission that it was supporting. Yeah. So you still have to collect the data manually and then you can run it through drone deploy for processing. So it really depends. I mean, what I'm seeing across the board is basically if you look at DJI Fly app, either on the you know Air 2, Air 2S, the Mini 2, Mini 3, uh, and the Mavic 3, just the uh, SDK isn't fully open. Mm -hmm. So you can't really do you know full features on them. The one app I did try and I still like is the Lychee app, which is yep. now working with the Mini 2. Yeah, and the yeah, so drone deploy kind of stated that the, the reason why I like you kind of do a, a side step around the, the, the limited SDK to kind of get full autonomous flight um, services up. Yeah, but Lychee is like what you said, like $20 a year and, and drone deploy is like 99 a month, I think, or something like that. Like it's it's not they're not even close yeah, <laughs> yeah they're mean, not I'll, even I'll, close but keep in mind leech is more for filming i really like you can do waypoint flight and you can program your camera to do different angles and different actions from point to point like personally i, I love it if i can manually fly you know a location get sort of the shots i want and then program it through lychee um i, I still love it and they actually have a really good uh, facebook group as well, and they have a pretty good, you know, online platform where people kind of share their flight path and share information. So they've got a good community going. And if you ask me, you know, the dollar a month, you definitely get a lot more for the buck by, you know, paying 20 bucks for the year and running a Lychee app, um, mm -hmm. obviously. But what drone deploy is more of the mapping processing features, right? Yeah, it would be interesting to see. I, you suggested I should try out Lychee just to kind of get some. Because I haven't really played around with third-party apps with with drones, so it'd be interesting to see, kind of compare them with a, you know, maybe get a trial of a drone deploy, just try them out, compare the two. So caution is Lychee only after one year of Mini Two release they were able to release support for Mini Two. So I mm. suspect you know if you're using newer drones like Mini Three or Mavic Three, it will still be a while before it's supported. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. Now, next news is, wow, this headline actually sounds very interesting. I guess, again, we'll have to look past it. 165-mile drone superhighway project. And looking <laughs> at the map here, looks like, wow, 265 kilometers. You know, that's quite a bit of distance. It is. And it's it's actually kind of a, a pretty smart idea for, for a country to kind of, like, focus. Similar to uh, the UK kind of uh, compared it to their... Um, when they started doing railroads, you know, they kind of, they set up uh, places, you know, where, where you can use the railroad tracks. Uh, and so the idea is between certain, uh, between these major company, uh, country, uh, not country, cities, your Cambridge, Oxford, um, and stuff like that, uh, you would have pretty much a more safer way for drones to travel. Uh, instead of having to worry about where everyone else is, um, there would be like these beacons on the ground that they would connect, they would kind um, communicate with and they would know where all the drones are so you don't necessarily have to worry about oh what's in front of me what's the side of me what's what's behind me you just go okay this is where i have to be and i know that i'm not going to hit anyone if i'm in this area if i'm in this spot which is very similar to your traditional aviation aviation yes right? that's it very dramatic. similar to what air traffic control does with when you're when you're flying a commercial airline no, they tell you be there you don't have to worry about hitting anyone yeah, yeah. Yep. um from air traffic control perspective, I mean, this is something that everyone wants to see, including, you know, Amazon and all the other countries, mm -hmm. is creating the highway in the sky and layering it properly. Because if you look at how, you know, general passenger airplanes fly, they take off from the terminal, which is your airport, mm -hmm. and then they climb to their cruising altitude, which is, you know, tens of thousands of feet up, and then they cruise from there to their destination. So if you look at that and if you design the drone highway and assign it a specific altitude, a specific route, um, then you're separating the traffic 
right? Just like mm-hmm. traffic on the ground, you've got regular highways and then you've got local roads, you've got streets where it's a lot more congested. So in theory, that's what we all would want to see. So I'm really interested to see how this project um, pans out because essentially you need to get everyone to work together. You need to get air traffic control to work mm-hmm. together, right? You need to make sure the highway is obviously infrastructure is there. You know, yeah. either it's the beacons, yeah. you know, your nav is, you know, there needs to be infrastructure that's actually there guiding the whole process. One um, that, one thing I think that would be nice to make sure there is, is that I didn't see anything about altitude and how high these areas would be. And I don't know what the rule, I don't know what the laws are over in England for altitude for drone flights, but every base here in the United States, like if we're doing something here in the United States, it would be 400 feet. Yep. Um, it would be nice that this was above 400 feet. Like, where there would be, if you're using this, you have a waiver that go above 400 feet. It's like between 400 and 500, and then planes can't go into the fat area, and then you're out of the range. You're not intruding in the uh, where other Your drones can be flying drone in. Flights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like not. You're yeah. not. I mean, you can. I mean, 400 and 500 feet. You know, you're not going to see a lot of planes flying there unless it's like a you know your your Sunday Cessna uh, pilot going out there for a Sunday cruise in the air. But you know, they can easily go up to you know 550 or something like that without without two issues. So I'm seeing two challenges with that. One is drone pilots have gotten used to 400 feet. And the reason being is, you know, typically your general aviation should stay 500 feet and above. I mean, generally speaking. Yeah. So you're giving like 100 feet, you know, barrier in between, right? Yep. So it's again, you know, are you feeling that barrier with drone taxis or delivery or are you finding, are you limiting regular drones to below, let's say 300 and give the 100 to the drone delivery, the highway guys, and then another hundred. I mean, I'm not an infrastructure designer. I can't tell you <laughs> that's right, but yeah. I can tell you that the first the first challenge would be is to keep your regular assessments above 500 feet. Like you don't see passenger or cargo airplanes, you know, go below thousands of feet when they're outside yeah. of the terminal area. I was, I was flying out the other, um, a few weeks ago and there was a guy flying, not, not really close to me. Like you could see them, but then you could tell they were probably like five some miles away. Uh, but it was definitely below, definitely that 500, 400 feet area, which was and they a little... And they don't turn on their transponders. Like they either don't have one or they don't turn it on. They're not in transponder airspace. So to me, is like if we can throw a transponder on, you know, on Air 2S and have a ADSB capability where airplanes can see where the drone is. I want to see where the general, you know, airplanes are. They should have those on. Yeah, but I was here in the, in the states. Right ADSB out is required, I believe, starting this year or last year. I think it was. Yeah, I don't know how it is in Canada, but yeah, down here, it, it, like all planes, it's starting have yeah. to have it out. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, and I'm that's sure there's a, some. Re, there's that's some a really good progress. It is. Yeah, I, I it's mean, really it's smart. That's a really good progress because rules have to go both ways: general aviation or you know, amend. Um, mm-hmm. aircraft like drones that that rule has to go both because if you're a drone operator in a kind of busy airspace area with a lot of like commercial um like private um uh, more uh not commercial but uh what was like just fun pilots flying around if you're in that area um you can put together an adsb receiver with a raspberry pi um and uh find an app that's relatively cheap like for flight or something like that and see all this stuff um relatively cheap actually if you're not even if you're just doing my background was doing this for for a natural light company but like if you're if you're just using i think uh i think if you're using one of the raspberry pi features i think you don't even need an app you can just uh connect to the uh, bluetooth and go to the ip address but do they have to do they have to have their adsb on or their transponder on uh well you want to see the track you see the adsb out that's what you'll see because i think everyone has to get adsb out um you want to see the transponder like you would see like at an air traffic control i think that's that's something more complicated so speak to me like if they have their adsb out then you should be able to see their their relatively you see their altitude and, and rel- close enough location. But not all of them had their ADSB up. Yeah, there's right? always going to be people who aren't going to be following the rules. And I, I, I know my experience in the general aviation is that there's a lot of old farts that really don't like when the rules change. And it's their life on the line. I mean, yeah. I don't want to crash my big drone with you know two um, sixteen thousand milliamp you know lipo batteries in their engine. It's going to bring yeah. them down. It's their life on the line. So I. I, I think they should take their safety a little more serious. And but, if we're going to be, if we're going to be required to have remote ID out, they should be required to have uh, again going both ADSB ways. Out. Yeah, right? uh, yeah, there is go both ways. It is going to be going both ways, and that's a whole another story. There you go. 
Uh, okay, final story for this week. Airworks is back to be in person again and back in Vegas this year, October 10th to 12th. Hey, I was and at the this Mirage. Is, this is the DJI event, right? Mm -hmm. This is really the DJI annual conference of the year and it's more targeting the uh, enterprise market. So if you look at it, let's say if we look at conference, uh, we've That's got... That's There wasn't much there. It looks like there's a lot more on the website now. Definitely, so awesome. yeah. Yeah, um, I hope they would have their drone because they, they're saying this is the year they're going to have their drone demo. So I hope they would have their drone box there because um, from I what really I hear can. is the actual product availability won't be until, you know, last last month of this year or uh -huh. early of, uh, of next year. But yeah, I'm they, really they have to have it. at least demo units. units yeah, I'm hoping to at least see it in action. Um, so like I said, you know, again, it's just the fact the Airworks is back to be in person this year is exciting because we've had two years of, you know, obviously remote. Um, and then plus, this would also be the first year where, you know, um, sort of everyone knew the face of DJI in States was Brandon Schumann, and now he's moved on to mm -hmm. a different venture. So it'll be interesting to see how this is actually run this year. I, uh, yeah, it'd be cool if we can get go. We can go maybe find someone to, to bring us out because that would be really fun. We could probably have some do some cool things out there. I uh, would love to go back to the Mirage. It's a very nice hotel. Uh, I got lost in it last year uh, for CES this year, but uh, I found my way. <laughs> it's a big hotel, <laughs> so yeah, it should be uh, hopefully super fun. Uh, super looking cool event. I, I'm a lot of the enterprise stuff just really like intrigues me. Just as like a like I, they could do so many th more things than you know I originally thought when I you know more got into the drones, so definitely. And I'm just looking forward to see, um, especially in this fall, you know, if there's any new units coming out from DJI to support it, uh, to support the enterprise side. <laughs> um, but overall, that's all the news we've got for you this week. We kicked off with uh, Microsoft Simulator update, then drone deploy now supporting the Air 2S. Uh, the drone highway project and especially if any of our audience is in UK please share your thoughts with us and at last is the DJI annual event back to be in person again this year so that's all the news we've got for you all and uh, look forward to seeing you next week <laughs>